start by acknowledging the First Nations um, owners of the country where this event is taking place, the Gubbi Gubbi people. Uh, I pay respects to them, their cultures and their elders past and present. I am really delighted to be here today. It is the, it, within the first month of my um, tenure as Queensland Chief Scientist. Michelle, I think, reached out on day one of the announcement being made to lock in my participation at this conference. So I really admired her enthusiasm uh, and determination and I said yes almost immediately. So um, it's, it really is a pleasure. Uh, and thank you to everyone um, for your involvement in this conference and its arrangement and, and participating um, so fully. And, it, and really, um, Siobhan, it was really, where are you? Oh, there you are. So great to, um, to hear your talk. Um, for me, you know, your generosity, your hard work, your enthusiasm really sums up what I, I see being the culture of citizen science and what makes it work. So thank you so much. Amazing, um, amazing talk and amazing, amazing contributions. So whilst it's an er early days for me in the role of um, Queensland Chief Sci Scientist, I've been a conservation scientist for a couple of decades now, and I, I know from my personal involvement and professional involvement in citizen science activities the contribution it makes to science. Uh, I've come from a university background predominantly, um, most recently at QUT, as, as was mentioned, um, but I'm also, um, well, up until starting this role, was deputy director of an Antarctic research centre, um, a safeguarding, safeguarding Antarctic. Antarctica's environmental future. And I'm also a researcher on the National Environmental Science Program um, Resilient Landscape Hub as well. And in both of those initiatives, um, I've had involvement with citizen science. As the Queensland Chief Scientist, my role, I'm trying to work it out what it is, what exactly is this role, um, is to provide independent um, advice to government and be responsible for our state's science strategy. Uh, for science engagement and also the promotion of Queensland science. And there's two of my team members here, Kylie and Mel. Um, so when I say I am responsible, there's a team of people um, that share that responsibility within the Department of Environment and Science. And Kylie and Mel are key to that. So as a scientist in Queensland and, and who's also been based overseas, I've led multiple interdisciplinary projects. And I guess fundamental to any science and any research is collaboration. Science is never a solo sport. And there's many different forms that, that collaboration can take place, as we're all aware, with government, with industry, with the private sector, with public. And, and citizen science is part of that collaborative circle. Today I'm going to share with you uh, some, in, you know, some insights into the Queensland government's efforts and ambitions to increase citizen science participation. I'm going to profile some of our fabulous citizen science projects that have been supported in Queensland by the government, by in, in also the Office of the Queensland Chief Scientist. I'll share a few of my thoughts on strengthening the links between citizen science and mainstream science, if you want to call it that and my, my views on the future uh, opportunities for citizen science in our state. So first up, in preparing for this talk, uh, I can say without a doubt, Queensland government is, increase, is committed to increasing the number of citizen scientists in our state. And I always ask questions, why? Why would, be, why would that be the case? And it's because the, our government has a strong acknowledgement of the value in the community engaging with scientists on real research projects and engaging in the process of scientific data collection. Ultimately, citizen science provides a platform to ensure the importance of science for our own lives, for our community, and for the society as a whole. Mel's um, indicating that maybe something's wrong with my volume. Do you think my mic? No? Okay. I always think I'm taller than I am, so I have this problem with the microphone. <laughs> anyway, um, and for scientists, the involvement of citizen scientists can enhance the geographical and longitudinal data that is supporting research. Effectively, extra sets of eyes, hands and brains on a research problem. My observation is that for researchers, it can also play an important training and research and development component as well, where ultimately educators 
in science and that education component is two-way. So I'm really pleased that the Queensland Government and my office within it has had a long history of supporting citizen science in our state. We are really proud of the fact that we were the first state to have a strategy that recognised the contributions of citizen scientists and to acknowledge their benefits explicitly. Since we launched the Queensland Citizen Science Strategy in 2019, we've, seen, we've continued to see many projects establish and thrive with tens of thousands of people engaging in citizen science here. At the time when we launched this strategy, the then Queensland Chief Scientist, Dr Christine Williams, who I'm sure many of you are familiar, also helped establish the Queensland chapter of the Australian Citizen Science Association with many of your support and input and hard work. And I'm pleased that this chapter remains active and seeks to develop its own opportunities for citizen scientists and positive impact on science. And I understand that many of the volunteers here have been working to deliver this national conference and I thank you so much for your ongoing efforts. So that's a bit of history, 2019 strategy. Um, that strategy has now been worked into our broader Engaging Queenslanders in Science strategy. Mel, you're helping with my slides. You're awesome. I completely forgot to press the button, so thank you. Um, so it's not an indication of my broader capabilities. It's just in the moment <laughs> right now. <laughs> Anyhow, so in, the, in our Engaging Queenslanders in Science strategy, we have a um, specific goal in relation to citizen science, and that's one of increasing community participation in citizen science to grow scientific literacy and contribute to scientific discovery. And central to that goal, right in the middle actually, literally, is uh, the notion that it's important to foster a community that is science literate. So what's the bigger picture concept going on there? Well, every one of us is being bombarded with information and misinformation on a daily basis. And we, we know the importance of enabling people to critically think about that information and check that unchecked flood of information that's coming in. So we see that engaging Queenslanders in citizen science projects can help to build that scientific literacy. It can also enhance public understanding of uncertainty and risk due to climate change and other environmental changes as well. So I can say that the Queensland Government views that a community that is science literate and engaged in science will be better prepared to plan for and react to the challenges that we all face in society. At the heart of our Engaging Queenslanders in Science strategy is encouraging people to get involved in science events and festivals. And yesterday I was at the pre-launch of the lineup for the Queensland Science Festival next year in Brisbane in March. And you know, that's an example, I guess, of the engagement that Queensland and the support that Queensland Government has given the Queensland Museum to run that festival as a really core component of engaging Queenslanders in science. I was really struck um, by one of the, the stats that Jim Thompson shared yesterday, he's the CEO of the Queensland Museum Network, that last year participation in the, um, in the World Science Festival um, saw 62% of people attending that hadn't attended the previous eight years. So we're getting new people coming into that festival every year. So I encourage you to take a look at the lineup for next year. It's quite... Uh, I guess, a, an expression not only of STEM, but also of the arts. And so I think it will engage the community really nicely. Another aspect of citizen science that really resonates for me is that anyone can be involved. And we, we often say, oh, you don't need a science degree to do citizen science, and that's certainly, certainly the case. But you can also be from any background, from any town, and from any age. And that's another important component as to why the Queensland Government is, is committed to growing citizen science in our state. And then you think, I, I guess in my own research, I think about co-benefits and what are the, um, you know, how can one aspect of our endeavour leverage another? And I was really struck, I've been really struck by the relationship between participation in citizen science, particularly those that are around sustainability and the environment, not only benefiting the environment and, and, and contributing to conservation, 
but also enabling those participants to feel more empowered and gain health and wellbeing benefits. There's a recent paper you may have received, um, seen uh, published in late October that was funded by the Arthur Ryler Institute and by the Victorian government. And it, it was a randomised control paper, so you know, the underpinning of its methodology was um, robust, but it highlighted, the results highlighted that participants reported positive outcomes um, from participation in citizen science that were around their mental and physical health and in particular if those projects were environmentally focused. I, I reckon, you know, I'm putting it out there, there's an opportunity to further that type of research to systematically and um, empirically quantify those benefits of citizen science in the delivery of the projects that we're already running. Okay, thanks. I can take a breath. You guys can clap, I can breathe. I've got a lot to cover today, sorry. I won't say sorry, but in, in preparation for this, Kylie and I digging and digging and digging into what the Queensland government's been doing, what you all have been doing, and we had to we had to take stuff out because it would have gone all, on all day. And in, in fact, when I was relaying to my husband um, about the projects that we were profiling, he's like, "How are the people whose projects you aren't profiling going to feel?" And I'm like, "No, this is fine. We're all part of this team, and these are just great examples." Um, of our citizen science expertise in our state. Anyhow, I digress. A big focus for us in the Queensland government and also, and it's strange for me to refer to myself as a government employee still, it sounds weird, but a big focus for me as Queensland chief scientist, nonetheless, is to engage young people uh, to build their STEM skills. Yeah, I love this. Yeah, two claps. I'm going to go for three. Let me see if I can get that. Um, and that's because we, you know, we all need a workforce out there in Queensland and nationally that have well, they're well equipped with STEM skills and critical thinkers as well. So encouraging more students to consider STEM subjects and careers is a key component of our engaging the science in Queensland strategy that I mentioned before. And we do that, the Queensland Chief Scientist Office does that by sharing opportunities for students to participate in citizen science projects and other STEM events. And we want our teachers, our amazing teachers, to embrace citizen science in the classroom also. So several years ago, as part of the Queensland Curriculum Review, we provided the Queensland Curriculum and Assessment Authority practical examples and ideas of how citizen science could be utilised within the curriculum. More recently, the Queensland Chief Scientist website has been updated to compile with a, com a compilation of information for teachers, including tips on how to join an existing citizen science project or how they could start their own. We are looking to grow this list. You know, there's numerous websites out there, and well, we want this to be the go-to place. So if you have material that you would like to be shared with our teachers, please send them through and we'll add them after some checking to make sure that they're good to the to the website. You'll see on, on our webpage um, an example which is the, of, of the Maggot Menageries project which was delivered by Dr Frank Sadler at Griffith University and I'm just going to mention that one briefly for a minute. I'm really glad that this picture doesn't kind of explicitly show what that project was about and I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, but we've got on there both his published paper about the project and a quick guide that he developed for us on how to deliver citizen science with school children. So this project received funding from the Department of Environment and Science to engage regional students from Roma, Isis and Nanango to be involved in constructing fly um, cages to rear young maggots for use in medical treatment, and in particular medical treatment uh, in military conflict zones, where we know the complexity associated with treatment in those um, contexts can be really challenging, and maggot care being a low um, resource, low cost wound care solution. So this project developed um, I guess, information that fed into that broader 
treatment um, regime. And Dr. Sadler highlighted for us through the execution of this project some of the benefits that he found from um, engaging school students. One was that there was an explicit link to the curriculum. There's benefits and co-benefits again. And the students got that first-hand experience of the role of science, uh, the role of science in everybody's lives and the role of science in other people's lives that are less privileged than, our, than our, ourselves in, here in Queensland. The students reported a sense of achievement through their involvement and, of course, they got that, that kind of science literacy component as well. Uh, Dr. Stadler's paper hi also highlighted some key lessons and in particular he recommended, and I'll quote, that student citizen scientists must have enough time to conduct the research and keep detailed records. This will require negotiation with teachers, parents and educators, and, and their educators and also the students themselves. Researchers need to consider the competing demands on students and adjust, uh, adjust their objectives accordingly. And, and as a mother of two high school age kids, those students must be prepared to invest additional homework time. That's probably the biggest challenge, um, biggest challenge there, but a really core component of this because their, their curriculum is stacked. So I recommend though that you take the time to investigate this project and other resources on our website, please. Send stuff through if you'd like to see it profiled as well. Um, and consider engaging um, with teachers and students as part of the delivery of your own projects. There's another similar project that I, I wanted to quickly share because it's got a nice, a nice story attached to it. And this was the project Parasites in the Wild, which was one, run of, not Reefologic, Ecologic, Parasites in the Wild. We don't have a picture now, don't worry. <laughs> Can't criticise my helper, sorry. <laughs> um, so Parasites in the Wild was run a few years ago by CQU University researchers and that it was focused on studying the ornate kangaroo tick. Um, and this project, as a citizen science project, involved livestock producers, game meat harvesters and wildlife carers, as well as 116 school children who also collected and analysed ticks. They had some discoveries, so they discovered a new subspe subspecies and also a new, an entire new genus of tick that was new to their region. So that's pretty cool. But what I was really thrilled to hear was that one of the students, who was probably seven or eight at the time, um, he, he's continuing to collect ticks and drop them off to the researcher with enthusiasm and delight. And so this project, even though it's now completed officially, is having a long lasting impact on that individual. And I just think that's fabulous. And that relationship is continuing to, to grow. So, you know, we're often thinking about the bang for our buck and the impact and the widespread scale up possibilities. But there's also, you know, stories like that really resonate with me because, you know, ultimately we are all individuals and we're impacting individuals. So, as a researcher, I often ask, where's the money? I want money for my work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about money um, and the role that Queensland Government again has had in funding citizen science projects. So we've been running what's called an Engaging Science Grants Program since 2016. That's allocated $2.7 million to 230 grant recipients. And I know some of you are, are here today and we, we thank you for your delivery and execution of those projects. Because many of them have been for citizen science projects. We also delivered two rounds of grants in 2019 and 2020, which allocated $1.2 million to 43 Queensland citizen science recipients for longer term projects. I'm interested in impact of those projects, both at the individual and at, at the larger area. And one stat that I'd like to share with you is that those grants and their delivery has um, enabled 66,000 people to engage in citizen science in Queensland. So that's a, yeah, third clap, awesome. I got more, I got more claps coming. So <laughs> we, you, you're probably all aware that we've just closed another round of the Engaging um, Science grants and that was, there was a specific focus within that round on eco, ecotourism citizen science as well. And 
And while I'd love to be able to push those through and announce them today, um, they'll be announced early next year. So I understand um, so far we've been hearing about some projects. I'm now going to shout out about a couple of um, projects uh, that have been delivered here in our state. And the first one is Reef Ecologic. There was no, um, there was no surprise there. They've been um, a champion of citizen science on the Great Barrier Reef for decades, um, facilitating the collection of hundreds and thousands of research-grade marine wildlife data points through the iNaturalist, which Siobhan was talking about also earlier this morning, and also Reef Blitz events um, as well. And partnering with Eye on the Reef, Reef Check, and also Coral Watch. So thanks to an engaging science grant, They've been recently deepening the relationship with the James Cook University Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Marine Science Program and adding school students to their list of projects as well. So they presently have two Indigenous high school students from Palm Island and Townsville that will be part of the project, learning from leading Indigenous and non-Indigenous scientists and managers um, and rangers conducting citizen science themselves and also receiving professional development and qualifications in diving and boat operations as part of the Reef Ecologic Mentoring Young First Nation Leaders in Marine Science Project. So I, I, I shout out about Reef Ecologic because I, I think it's a really great demonstrator of the partnerships and how partnerships can be built into these initiatives to build um, science skills and literacy, as we've discussed, um, and fo also foster conservation efforts. I also want to mention Platypus Watch. See, I can do it. Um, Platypus, Platypus Watch um, is, I guess, you know, someone that grew up in North Queensland is a project close to my heart because platypus are notoriously difficult to identify in the wild, to see in the wild. Um, and But now through Platypus Watch, watch they're using eDNA to detect platypus, so the presence of platypus. And one um, project that the Queensland government funded taught 30 people how to sample water from the Dawson River and spot also spot platypus in Theodore. The Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland has just celebrated 20 years of citizen science with their platypus, platypus watch program. I think that should be applauded as well. Um, not that I could say platypus watch, but the, uh, the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland's efforts. Um, and it, because it, it demonstrates that longitudinal data collection and also that engagement with conservation efforts as well. So it makes sense for me now, because I've mentioned it already, to briefly touch on eDNA um, being you know, the latest um, conservation tool, well, not so much the latest now, but an important new tool for um, detecting species. We're using it in Queensland across multiple projects to identify invasive species, to monitor elusive and rare cryptic species, to detect um, crown of thorns starfish um, presence in their early life stages, uh, and also to identify whether polluted waterways are uh, on the improve or not. So there are adv recent advant advances in eDNA data collection that's making it easier for incorporating it into citizen science projects. And I, the Wet Tropics in eDNA project um, is one example of that. So they're using um, fine filter paper sampling techniques to look at the impacts on, uh, of water pollution on freshwater and estuarine marine ecosystems. And in particular, I want to um, point out that MAMU Indigenous Rangers and other volunteers from um, up north, from the Cairns and, and far North Environment Centre and Terrain NRM, um, are monitoring different spots in rivers that are really close to my heart, um, Mossman, Barron, Foot Johnson and Tully River catchments. And the hope is that this eDNA sampling will support fish monitoring in the future um, in a rapid and non-destructive way. So it's fantastic to see that cutting edge science being introduced um, in a feasible way into these projects to monitor for, um, to identify, I guess, improvements or, or otherwise in these systems. So now that's a bit of water and marine, I'm gonna move on to land. And I'm excited to an announce today 
work that's being released by the Queensland Herbarium um, that's also adding to our knowledge and adding to our efforts uh, in conservation and includes much data collected by citizen scientists. And that's in relation to koalas in our state. So we have the largest in southeast Queensland, the highest con concentration of koalas, and we know uh, that they are under threat and that we need enhanced efforts to protect and restore their key habitat. So each year, the Queensland government updates what's called the koala habitat area mapping. And I mentioned that today because these updates capture um, data collected by citizen scientists through iNaturalist and also the Q Wildlife apps. And that information is portrayed in the mapping efforts and then used to inform our management and policy efforts as well. So the Q Wildlife app is the Department of Environment and Sciences initiative to collect koala sightings data throughout Queensland. And you may have um, seen the talk yesterday by Maggie. Um, and if you didn't, then please um, find her, track her down and talk to her about um, this initiative. It's having, a, a, I guess, a great impact on koala sightings and records. So 23,000 people have downloaded the app already since June. That's amazing. And it's had a 31% increase in the past month of the sightings data that's been uploaded. So that's incredible um, reach. In terms of lessons from this project, I guess some things are emerging around um, collecting observations through multiple apps and platforms. And I, and I believe the advice from Maggie would be to enter your data into one app because duplicate records can slow down the process of using that material and re reusing it for management and policy. There's other um, citizen science projects under the Threatened Species Program that I'll, I'd like to um, just mention, and that is around a new one that's being launched around threatened plant management and recovery. So this team is in the early days of establishing this program and the key person to talk to is John. John, are you here? Because I'm going to tell people to talk to you. Hi, John. He's out the back. Um, but John would love to talk to um, you, you, you all, he probably has been already, uh, about establishing this threat, threatened plant focus citizen science um, program uh, in order to fill knowledge gaps, key knowledge gaps. So, John. You're on the hook. Finally, for those working in the sustainability space, you're probably familiar with WildNet. So WildNet has 21,000 species records in it, and the Department of Environment and Science is committed to WildNet and also working with citizen science groups to continue best practices for data collection. So I understand James Wilson is here today. Where's James? There, he's in the back row. Hi, James. Um, and James would, um, is here to, to chat about um, WildNet and, and he encourages you to reach out to him if you've got any um, questions. So, you know, I guess I've given you a bit of a, a whip around some of the Department of Environment and Science um, initiatives and apps and programs. Um, and, and I just wanted to relay that the teams you know, within the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service and also within the Science Division have a really strong interest in citizen science and they're convening internally to consider best practice processes and ideas for collaboration in the future. So I think you know, I'm quite biased. I like to talk about the environment and conservation, um, but I did mention before that connection with human wellbeing and health. And I'm now just going to touch on a couple of projects that we're running in Queensland that have that more direct health um, connection. One of the ones is so so Soils for Science, Citizen Science Program. Um, sorry, that was quite a tongue, tongue twister. And this project's dedicated to finding new antibiotics to um, superbugs, so drug-resistant infections. What we can do as um, Queenslanders is send in a soil sample to our colleagues at the University of Queensland who are looking for microbes in those soil samples 
uh, in their search for future antibiotics. And I think this is, and I highlight this because it's a wonderful example of the contributions we can all make that could have immediate impacts on our own health, but also hundreds of thousands of other people around the world as well. Another health-focused citizen science project that I'll just talk about briefly is the Dignity Project. Um, and it was one of the three projects nominated for the Eureka Prize for Innovation for Citizen Science in 2022. Now, this was recognised as the first digital health citizen science initiative, um, and it partnered with people with a disability as paid citizen science scientist researchers. And core to the Dignity Project is driving research and advocacy to break down barriers for people with a disability in all aspects of their service utilisation. So the findings from this project, and I think this is really, really critical, they've helped the Queensland Spinal Cord Injury Service and also the Department of Transport and Main Roads implement changes to process to improve the health and well-being being of Queenslanders with a disability. So feeding back into those service provision um, requirements. I think it's fantastic. and But it's also been used um, as, as part of, to inform the first statewide disability survey and to set a baseline for Queensland's disabilities plan and Australia's disability strategy. So it's having a wider reach as well. Another non-environmental citizen science project um, that's seen some really fantastic outcomes is the Study Fresh project. And here, um, 635 students, again, we're going back to this connection into the curriculum and to STEM, um, across 20, 22 schools in Queensland attended these Study Fresh workshops that were delivered at the University of Queensland. And in essence, they became electrical engineers for the day. What were they doing? What they were doing was developing uh, loggers to measure CO2 in the classroom. Um, and they deployed these loggers across 68 classrooms in Queensland to look at indoor air quality. And the report that came back to those students and those school participants um, identified how poor indoor air quality can affect their concentration and their cognition. And also, as we're all very aware now, facilitate the spread of airborne diseases. So this project has received follow-up funding through the Engaging Science Grants Project and has been now implemented in schools in regional Queensland as well. So in terms of the future, um, so as the Queensland Chief Scientist, I'm really positive about the future of citizen science in our state. We've got a long history of engagement and support and adv advocacy and we have many committed um, government employees across the state, but also here with us that are um, here to learn and share as well uh, their knowledge on citizen science. So a couple of thoughts from me on how we might strengthen citizen science going forward. So I would suggest that we all take a look at existing projects and look to collaborate where we can. You know, that connection between the environment and health is a, a an indicator of these nodes connecting to create more. So w working together collectively and not reinventing um, what others have already done or plan to do. I also think it's really important that we work out ways to retain participants. Um, as a, on a personal level, as a citizen scientist, you can participate in one project, have a great experience, and then ask, you know, what's next? What else can I do? So directing participants to other projects that need, um, yeah, need their input or would benefit from their citizen expertise, I think is a really good way also of collaborating and working together. The, the third point there is around co-developing projects so that we, you know, we look to involve in projects scientists and researchers that can also help to ensure that the data is more reliable. And I talk a little bit now just about data and um, reliability. So for the Engaging um, Science Grants, one of the key el eligibility criteria is that there's a scientific advisor that's involved uh, in, those, in the projects that are put forward. And this is because we know that in order to make the best use of citizen science 
data, we need that data to be collected using robust, repeatable methods, and that the data is available and made discoverable, as Siobhan you know, clearly articulated today. We can see the benefits going forward of your work, but of, of many others that make their data open. But this type of data, you know, it, it's not lost on me, it requires additional resources and commitment, attention to process and detail. Um, but it will deliver those longer term benefits, you know, in the environment space of being able to facilitate our understanding of change uh, and the causes of that change and the measures that we might take, uh, government and others, to mitigate those impacts. So I would say, and I would uh, end with sharing data and finding um, and communicating with all your participants in your projects, be them um, the citizen scientists, of course, but also local and state and national gov um, governments, other researchers, communicate to the public, share what information you've collected and how, how you've gone about it. Now, before I finish up today, and I'm nearly done, um, I just wanted to quickly touch on some research that Angela Dean, who some of you may be aware of, and I conducted um, recently. And I think it's kind of a nice connection to the conversations we're all having at this conference. And it's on the topic of hope. So Angela is an environmental psychologist. And we were really interested in unpacking the differences between optimism and hope and what can give hope to, to people. I won't go through the, the, the study in detail, but one of the key components of having hope for a better future, despite the mess that we sometimes feel that we're all in, um, is around having pathways for action, at an individual level, community level, and um, more broadly. And I mention this because I think citizen science gives everyone the opportunity to identify those pathways and be part of solutions and therefore drive hope for a better future, which is an important underpinning for cultural, cultural change as well. So just to finish off, um, in my role as Queensland Chief Scientist, I'm really keen to grow the community of citizen scientists um, and those working together to um, have more scientific discoveries, some of which we've spoken about today. For our researchers where citizen scientists are involved, um, I would encourage you to acknowledge their efforts um, full-heartedly, as, as Siobhan said, give credit where credit is due. But just to, to finish by saying thank you, thank you to you all, thank you to my colleagues here, many familiar faces um, and new faces, and I look forward to meeting you over morning tea. But I, I congratulate you for supporting science in Queensland and beyond. So thank you very much. I'd love to take questions. Thanks. Not any hard questions or questions about what the Queensland Chief Scientist does. I'm still working that one out. <laughs> Thanks very much, Kerry. That was fantastic. Thank you for that overview of what's happening in citizen science in Queensland and the great work that, you know, the uh, infrastructure that underpins that in terms of the strategies and plans. Um, I think we're kind of all singing from the same hymn sheet as well. And um, I love your enthusiasm for citizen science. That's wonderful. And... Uh, and also, um, I think, echo the cry about where's the money, you know. Um, so, a question for Kerry. Time for a couple of questions, I reckon. Um, this might go to the money question, but I'm um, interested to know what level of collaboration there is or knowledge sharing or project sharing amongst the other state chief scientists. So, um, I'm from New South Wales. Don't hate me, um, but um, just interested um, because you know if, if everybody knew about the successful projects in each state, and then the chief scientists could export them around the country, you know there'd be a role for um, like a, a super body like CSIRO to help coordinate that or something. Um, but interested to know what level of sharing and collaboration there is. Yeah, that's a great question, and um, and I was going to make some notes because. We do have a forum of Australian chief scientists led by um, Dr. Kathy Foley. And so the, the, all the um, chief scientists or their science leaders around the country come together regularly to discuss what's going on in their states and territories and how we can work together and learn from each other. So we have that platform already and it's been ongoing for a while. I'm 
chatting with Dr. Foley on Friday this week. Also, she wants to know about the Engaging Queenslanders in Science strategy and the grants program we've been running because she's seeing it as really quite unique and she would like to learn from that and do exactly what you say, cascade that around um, around the, the states and territories also. And she's interested nationally what she can do in engaging Australians in science too. So, you know, the work and the leadership from Lauren and the team at the Office of the Queensland Chief Scientist, I think, can really be celebrated um, through their delivery of that strategy and that program because it is catching the attention nationally as well. But, I, I, yeah, exactly that model is um, one of the reasons why I thought this job would be fun. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Jesse Oliver, who was instrumental in getting that strategy through. Absolutely. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah. And thanks, Michelle. So while you were talking, I was having a look at some of those reports and quickly went down to the copyright section and was really pleased. Oh, good. Very, very pleased. <laughs> <laughs> to see that it was openly licensed under a CC BY, so anyone can reuse that sort of information, and, and particularly in Wikipedia for my interests, but anyone for any interests, you know, school projects, whatever. What I would like from you as a person, because I have talked to numerous, and I mean numerous Australians, wanting access to, at the very least, to the CSIRO images. They should be openly licensed for reuse. There is absolutely no reason my view, <laughs> that they should be closed. It may be that the research that they generate, may maybe there's money reasons for the research to be closed license to get return on it. Mm. If there's arguments for that, I could almost get away with, no, maybe not, but, uh, but for the images themselves, I just would love for those to be openly licensed so that citizen science groups can create decent um, field notebooks, field handouts, Wikipedia could use it. I mean, the reuses are just go on forever. And I feel very sorry for Australians that their national organisation is not openly licensing something that valuable for citizen science. Yeah, no, thank you. And it was, I guess, that was new to me, I must admit, um, around the, the licensing and restrictions on that. On that. It's something I'll, I'll pay attention to. I don't think I've got any power to change it. Um, but... You know, messages messages repeating are always helpful. Um, but no, thank you very much. And there might be others in the room here that have some insights or inside networks uh, that can, can feed that back too. Um, yeah, it was really striking in your talk to, to understand that, you know, those restrictions, while they might seem kind of frivolous at the time, can have such flow and effects through this cycle that we're all trying to play a role in in information and knowledge sharing for change. So really appreciate you pointing that out. Thank you. Um, yes, just thank you. That was wonderful. Um, I'm from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and oh, cool. Society. Yes. And there's no chief social scientist. Oh. Uh, but we're doing, I don't think. Or well, I take science to be broadly also inclusive of social science. So I'm right. the person. <laughs> right, so that's, um, uh, and in Europe they think of science as research, but here we do tend to think of science, and you did say you're encouraging STEM, uh, you know, students, not more broadly, and even to run a citizen science project is a social skill. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I was just, uh, how are we also going to expand those projects to help people think that actually it could be a social project, it could be an arts project, it could be... You know, uh, we're doing online uh, data donation projects, you know, how to understand digital platforms. So, yeah, just just um, how are we going to support citizen science across more areas? Yeah, that articulation of that connection to social science was, yeah, perfect, spot on. And um, and sorry for not making that acknowledgement. Um, totally appreciate that this these are social projects. Uh, and the work that I've done with the, the likes of Angela Dean really speaks to how do these projects create change and, um, and what are the mechanisms and behaviours that they enable. So absolutely support that. And, you know, one of my, I guess, achievements in this role would be to broaden that connection and the depth at which we treat social science as well. I've had, had some early conversations with Lauren 
already. So thank you so much for pointing that out. We appreciate it. Thank you.